to Ben, who, who is going to take us for his second session of the day. Thank you very much. Ben, you are still All muted right. at the moment. It Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you very much, um, IHUK, for inviting me to um, give this talk today. Um, my background is I'm a neurology consultant um, who recently joined the Birmingham team, and I work with Professor um, Alex Sinclair and Miss uh, Susan Mullen um, in the IIH service there, which you probably know is one of the, the biggest um, IH services in Europe. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about a an exciting um, trial um, which is about to kick off um, um, early next year. Okay, so um, so you're all well versed on um, IAH um, and uh, realize that it affects um, young women. Um, it affects about five per hundred thousand. So it's, it's a relative, but we know that um, certainly over the last 20 years, um, the incidence of IH is gradually um, in increasing. Uh, the main morbidity in IH is headache and, uh, of course, visual loss. And this is not a benign condition, and a small proportion of um, patients with IH do end up with permanent visual impairment, and a small proportion um, may actually go blind. And this is um, especially the case in patients who develop rapidly progressive visual loss. And uh, these patients um, don't respond to conservative management and uh, require some kind of surgical intervention to lower their intracranial pressure. So um, the key issue with this trial is um, how to treat a rapidly progressive visual loss. So how do we lower the intracranial pressure um, to prevent blindness. And um, a few years ago, um, Professor Alex Sinclair um, set up a, a program um, where we asked patients and physicians about what priority should be set um, for IIH research and determining what the best surgical intervention was for this condition was very high up on the list. Now at present, um, th there are three interventions which, which um, have been used to uh, reduce ICP. Um, today, we're just gonna talk about CSF shunting or cerebrospinal fluid shunting. And we're also going to introduce a dural venous sinus stenting, which is one of the newer interventions. And when we approached a number of um, specialists who, who, who look after patients with IH, so namely neurosurgeons, neurologists, ophthalmologists, and interventional radiologists, there was, there was clear uh, cut um, clinical equipoise in the sense that um, people didn't know which of these procedures was best. And um, in, this, in this situation, you need to have a, 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 a large randomized controlled trial to answer the question. And uh, we received um, funding from the NIHR to answer this question. Um, so before I talk about the trial in more detail, um, we do need to just understand how we lower uh, intracranial pressure, um, especially with respect to stenting. Um, the reason being is this, this may not be um, obvious straight away. So, um, so we know that uh, in IAH, um, there's a problem with drainage of cerebrospinal fluid. And over time, this leads to raised intracranial pressure. And normally, um, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF is drained via a system of large uh, blood vessels or sinuses um, in the brain um, down uh, to the jugular veins and then back into, into the circulation. And if there's any problem with this uh, drainage system, then uh, potentially you can have back pressure and that results in reduced absorption of uh, CSF and that results in raised intracranial pressure. And one of the consequences of raised intracranial pressure is that the, the optic disc, so that on, on your screens now that you can see it it's the it's the point of entry into the back of the eye uh, by the, by the um, optic nerve and the optic disc can become uh, swollen um, if there's increased in intracranial pressure and this uh, results in a condition called papilledema 
and you can see that normally the optic disc is nice and crisp and the blood vessels are very clear. But if you have raised intracranial pressure, then the disc margins become very blurred and this causes damage to the, um, to the optic nerve. And this results in, a, or can result in, in visual failure and progressive visual loss. And many of you uh, will have had this test done before um, as part of your workup for IH, you, you go to the clinic and you have a visual field assessment. And there's different um, visual field assessments on the bottom left of your screen. And essentially um, the darker the image, then the more uh, visual loss there is. And this is a very important um, marker of visual function. And it, it, en it enables us to follow patients with IH to see how they're doing. Okay, so at present, the gold standard for treating patients with rapidly progressive visual loss who have raised intracranial pressure is to put in uh, what's known as a CSF shunt. And a CSF shunt is a small um, tube which um, essentially drains the fluid from the brain into the abdominal cavity. And some of these systems have a, a valve which allows you to uh, regulate how much fluid is drained. And some of the systems um, also incorporate an intracranial pressure monitor so we can actually work out what the pressure is inside the brain. And essentially there's, there's two main uh, forms of this shunt. There's the so-called ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which um, connects the tube between the tummy and the abdominal cavity. It's right it's between the brain and the um, abdominal cavity. And then there's a lumbar peritoneal shunt, which connects the, the lumbar region um, and the peritoneal cavity. Okay. And uh, we know that these uh, shunting systems uh, certainly work. Um, there's a graph at the bottom here, which just shows you a timeline um, in comparison for when um, a shunt is put in. So um, top left, um, you have uh, evidence of uh, swelling in the back of the eye or papilledema. And after the shunt goes in, the swelling um, gradually reduces over time. So we know that shunts are very effective in uh, lowering intracranial pressure and they're very effective in um, preventing patients from going blind. Okay, so um, back to the drainage system. Um, when it comes to uh, stenting, um, the stents are used to open up the drainage system and uh, improve the flow of um, CSF um, out of the brain. Okay, so um, one, one process which we think happens in um, IAH is a process whereby um, raised intracranial pressure uh, results in uh, collapsing um, of the drainage system. And this manifests as uh, focal areas of um, stenosis. And you can see on the figure on the right here where the red circle is, the, the drainage system is pinched in and we call that a stenosis. And um, we know that when we scan patients with IH um, and look at the blood vessels in their brain, at least 95% uh, of them will have these um, focal areas of stenosis. And you can see here by the white arrow that the, the transverse um, sinus or the large drainage vessel at the back of the brain is pinched. And uh, it's thought that this reduces the, um, the outflow of CSF and re again results in raised intracranial pressure. So essentially you get caught in this vicious cycle where there's reduced drainage in the brain. Uh, this, this then leads to uh, reduced uh, CSF absorption, and then the pressure goes up, and then you have this vicious cycle um, which, which drives everything. Okay, so one way of treating this um, is to put a small stent within the focal area of stenosis, and this is called um, a stenting procedure. And uh, typically, um, a small wire catheter is introduced in the groin and it's fed up uh, up through the heart to the brain and then a small uh, piece of mesh is, is uh, put in to expand the uh, collapsed blood vessel. And um, this procedure is typically done when patients are uh, awake and uh, it's, it's generally, it's very well tolerated. And it's done by um, uh, interventional uh, neuroradiologists as opposed to um, neurosurgeons. So, um, so there we have lots of data um, looking at how uh, CSF shunting and stenting uh, lowers intracranial pressure. Um, 
we've never compared these two um, different procedures head to head, and there's certainly been no randomized controlled trials seeing um, how they fare and how patients with um, these, these different procedures do over the, the longer term. We know that both of them uh, reduce uh, intracranial pressure, and uh, we know that CSF shunting is very effective in preserving vision, and we don't know about the long-term consequences of stenting and whether or not that can preserve vision. Both of these uh, procedures are associated with different complications. In the case of stenting, um, sometimes the, um, the, the thin tube can become ruptured uh, or broken, um, it can become blocked, and sometimes it can become infected. And overall, um, we know that between 11 and 70% uh, of uh, shunts fail and require revisions. And this is very disruptive um, for patients, um, especially if they have uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts, because once this is placed, uh, you, you're not allowed to drive um, for six months. In the case of stents, the stents can become blocked. And sometimes what can happen is you can put a stent in and you can solve one um, stenosis, um, but then the adjacent uh, blood vessel um, then becomes um, stenosed um, as, as the surrounding uh, pressure in the brain increases. So this is a problem. And overall, um, up to a fifth of um, stents fail. And one of the problems with stents is that patients are required to be on um, anticoagulation. And this is typically um, uh, antiplatelet um, drugs like aspirin for um, up to six months. And these can, of course, cause um, other problems. So the key thing here is that we don't know, uh, we don't know um, what happens if you compare CSF shunting uh, with stenting um, because a trial has never been done before. And that's led to this trial, which we, we call the IIH intervention trial. So this is a multi-center open randomized controlled trial um, across the UK. And we're, we're uh, specifically comparing dural venous sinus stenting uh, with CSF shunting. And um, uh, there is a large network of um, uh, neurosurgeons, ophthalmologists and neurologists and interventional neuroradiologists across the UK who are very interested in um, IH and very interested in um, answering this important question. And uh, we have in total um, 17 or 18 different uh, neuroscience centers across the UK where we're, where we're hoping to recruit patients for this study. So, um, so the, main, uh, the main objectives for this study are to compare stenting versus shunting in terms of the, uh, the clinical effectiveness on um, preventing uh, rapidly deteriorating vision, um, but also to look at the economic side of things as well, because we know that um, there are different complication rates with these procedures, and uh, the complications um, have different costs attached to them in terms of how long patients stay in hospital and how often they need to have um, other, other, other treatments for. So it's gonna be very interesting to see which of these procedures is the most cost effective. And um, this, this trial um, will occur across uh, 18 different neuroscience centers and patients will be recruited from a variety of different settings it may be the case that most patients who present uh, are, are recruited from the, from the ophthalmology department where they present with deteriorating vision, but there may be patients on neurology wards, general medical wards, or even from the emergency room. And patients will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to these different treatments. And like uh, with many of these trials, patients won't be able to choose what treatment they have, they'll be randomized. So um, in terms of the inclusion criteria to be in this trial, um, obviously patients will, will require to have a, a diagnosis of IH. They'll also have to have swelling or papilledema in the back of their eyes, and they'll have to have evidence of rapidly progressive visual loss. And this is something that we're going to define with our uh, ophthalmology um, colleagues over the next uh, few months to work out exactly how quickly and how bad your vision needs to get before you can be recruited to this trial. Patients also need to be suitable for both shunting and um, stenting. So as part of the workup, everyone will have a, a brain scan 
And um, in order to be in this trial and, and in, in order to be randomized, you'll have to have evidence of these um, stenoses, which I outlined earlier. And um, the main exclusion criteria for this trial it, are that you can't have had any um, surgical intervention before. So if, you've, if you had a shunt in situ before and that's failed, then you wouldn't be allowed to be in this trial. And also you can't have any um, background uh, ocular disease, which will make it difficult for us to assess um, your vision over the longer period. So, um, so uh, in, in trials like this, we have to have uh, outcome measures where we can see um, whether or not one particular treatment is better than the other. And uh, the, the, the primary outcome measure for this trial is um, something we call perimetric mean deviation. And, and many of you won't know what this is, but you will know what, what this is. So perimetric mean deviation is essentially um, a number which we get after you've had your visual assessment, which tells us um, how, um, how your visual function is compared to a normal population. And essentially the lower the number, and it goes into negative figures, that then the worse your vision is. And this is a good way of following patients with IAH. The secondary outcome measure will be the major complication rate. And we're, we're interested in, in serious complications um, and uh, that's defined by the so-called Clavian-Dindo uh, grading scale. And this is, a, this is a grading scale which is often used when different interventions are compared head to head. So we're, we're also looking at another uh, number of secondary um, outcome measures. And I'll just detail them here. This is a very busy slide, but it's just to remind me that there are lo lots of different things that we're looking at. So we're looking at different aspects of visual function, uh, many of you will be familiar with having um, an OCT, and that's when they take a photograph of the back of your eye and then look at the, um, the back of your eye in cross-section. And that allows us to see um, the degree of swelling or papilledema in the back of the eye. We're also going to be looking at changes in visual acuity. We're looking at lots of different details um, with regards to the actual procedure itself. Um, for example, failure rate, minor complication rate, um, in, how often patients uh, uh, represent and are readmitted to hospital. Um, so we're looking at lots of different aspects there. We're also looking at headache. So um, we're looking to see how severe headaches are um, and to see how many uh, painkillers patients take after they've had the procedure. Um, and we're also looking at a number of um, quality of life um, questionnaires, which helps us to assess vision and um, headache. Okay, so the interesting thing about this study is that um, not only are we seeing patients face to face for the first 12 months, um, but we're also doing long term follow up using what we call NHS big data. And this allows us to essentially um, work out over the longer term how often uh, patients are being readmitted to hospital and what complications they're having. So, so it allows us to do a much bigger study over time. Now, in terms of follow-up for this trial, um, following recruitment, um, people will be seen um, for the first 12 months of this trial. And most of the uh, visits to the uh, assessment clinic will be early on because that's when we expect most of the improvement with the, uh, with the vision to be. Okay, now this, this is a slightly complicated chart, but it's just to really give you an overview of the timelines involved in this trial. And uh, we, we won't be finished this trial until May uh, 2027, which seems so, so far ahead. And, and uh, so we won't, we won't be getting any results soon. Um, but you can see from this that the, uh, we, we plan to recruit um, patients over uh, 30 months. Um, and then we have a further 12 months of follow up. Um, and then we have to sit down, analyze the data, and then, um, and then we'll be able to let everyone know what's happening with this trial. So, um, so in summary, this is a, this is a very important and a, a very exciting uh, uh, randomized controlled trial, looking at two interventions to treat patients with IH who have progressively, uh, sorry, rapidly progressive visual loss. And we're, we're interested in the, the clinical outcomes, but also the cost effectiveness of these two uh, treatments. And we know that it's gonna have a significant impact on uh, clinical practice, not only in the UK, but across the world in terms of how to treat patients with this, this condition. 
So as, as you might expect, um, there are a lot of people involved in this trial, involved in the setup and running the trial. Um, I just want to just um, point you towards Professor Alex Sinclair, who's the chief investigator, and uh, key, uh, key uh, co-investigators, uh, Miss Susan Mullen, who's an ophthalmic surgeon, and Professor Philip White, who's an interventional radiologist um, from Newcastle, and also ev everyone else in the team and members of the um, IH UK, including Amanda Denton, who've also helped um, contribute towards this trial and, and, and its setup. So um, if any of you want to tweet me about this trial, um, then, then please feel free to tweet me or, or email me, and I'm more than happy to field any questions that you have. Thank you. It's wonderful. Firstly, thank you very much, um, Dr. Wakeley. Uh, really exciting to hear that there's going to be some research in um, this area. There's a couple of questions that have come through on the chat facility. Um, one of the first questions is about papilledema and why papilledema is a, um, an outcome measure for this trial or a criteria. So whether it was about it being an inclusion criteria that's correct. So, um, so first of all, papilledema um, is probably the best um, clinical sign that we have um, without doing a lumbar puncture that someone has uh, raised intracranial pressure. And we know that um, once, once someone's developed papilledema, then um, they are at risk of developing um, uh, problems with their vision um, over time, which, with, which if untreated, may result in blindness okay so um so so rarely um patients can have raised pressure in their head which doesn't result in um, papilledema but it can result in headaches and um, but we're not worried about vision in, in those patients so it's a, it, the reason it's a, cre a a key inclusion criteria for this trial is we know that if if someone has rapidly progressive vision in the context of papilledema that if they're, they're not treated then their vision will get worse Thank you. There's, a, there's another question which is asking about people who need a shunt revision, could they be offered stenting instead? Well, it's often the other way around actually. And we predict in this trial that, 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 that patients who um, go on to have the stenting and for whatever reason, if the stent fails, then the default will be to go back to have the, uh, the CSF shunting. Um, it, it, it's very unlikely to work the other way around. So if someone had a, a shunt in this trial and, and failed, we, we would go back in and do the shunt. We wouldn't offer them a, a stent because we know that we know from past experience that the shunt is the definitive uh, treatment. We know that it's definitely going to work. We just don't know how effective the stents are going to be. Thank you. Um, I know that you highlighted earlier about the research priority setting partnership exercise that was carried out, which highlighted that this area was something that was needed in, in research. Um, it's just to highlight for anybody who's watching, who's interested in finding out more about any of the other research priorities, it can be found on the IIH UK website. Okay. Um, I'm just having a look to see if there are any more questions in the chat facility. Um, I can't see any other questions in there at the moment. Um, it's just to highlight and pick up on something mentioned earlier is about our, our new shunt model, which wow. came in the um, <laughs> IIH UK um, shop. And these were developed with the 3D toy shop. So these can be put onto a teddy bear and they can be sewn on. But for every one of these that is sold through the IH UK website, we are putting one into an information pack to be sent out to healthcare professionals with the hope that they can be used in demonstrations to people um, as to what a shunt looks like on the inside as well. Sorry, Ben. That's, that, that, no, that's, ex that's excellent, Amanda, that's very good. But hopefully we'll be sending you one soon, Ben, as well, so that you have yep. one as well. So, so hopefully I'll be able to update you about the progress of this trial and some results in uh, May 2027. Fantastic. We'll look forward to hearing some more <laughs> results soon. And anything in the meantime, just to let people know that um, IIH UK is involved, as Ben said, and any updates that we're allowed to share along the way 
we will share them with you. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Ben, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you. Um, our next talk is by Miss Susan.